evening. Uh, welcome to tonight's lecture, uh, hosted by the Association of Foreign Affairs and Suspect. Tonight we have the honor to present the news and uh, who will get introduced by Lars from Suspect. So I will leave the word to Lars. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Niels Thielman Munk Petersen here again. Uh, he's coming from Bornholm, just arrived five minutes ago. Uh, this film is basically an anthropologist. I've been working 30 years uh, all over the uh, uh, Asia, Pacific, Latin America, Africa. Uh, yes, also lesser degrees, but besides anthropology, it's also lesser degrees in zoology, botany, and geology. And uh, for many years, he has been working as a consultant uh, for tourism planning in many, many countries in the world. world. Spent years in the Maldives, in Yemen, Mozambique, Pacific Island nations, and many other countries. So I leave the word to you. Yes, and I, I, I actually still do. I, I just came back on the Sunday from Bangladesh with a very difficult task. I'm supposed to be the uh, Eco-Tour and Advisor to the uh, uh, Bangladesh Department of Forestry. Before that I was in, in, uh, in Somaliland, only was back for one and a half day, and uh, now at the, around the 24th, 25th, I'm going back to the Andamans where I was in January to look at uh, the possibility of setting up an open air museum and uh, touristic facility for the Nicobar Islanders because the Nicobars are still an area where uh, neither foreigners nor Indians that, uh, don't have specific government functions are not allowed. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Good. Uh, let's say uh, I was asked to talk about tourism as uh, modern colonialism and uh, I felt that the theme was more or less that I should talk about uh, how the West was uh, using its power to recolonize uh, developing countries. And uh, so <coughs> I, I rewrote the, the title a little bit uh, because Let's say the uh, the West is not the culprit. The uh, industrialized nations are not the culprit. I mean, we are being accused of everything. We were the ones who invented slavery. We should pay for slavery. But let's say the Arabs uh, exported uh, more slaves than the Western powers ever did. And uh, the same thing is that tourism is nothing new. But it's true that uh, mass tourism, uh, group tourism, was invented in Europe, was invented in the West. Then there is always a discussion, what is a tourist? And if we look at the World Tourism Organization, uh, they'll say a tourist is somebody who is a certain distance away from home, staying more than 24 hours, and then the discussion is, is it less than a year, is it less than half a year, and so forth. Is, uh, all these definitions are very vague. So let's say uh, tourism is the world's biggest industry by now, but it's, it's very difficult to make a breakdown on earnings from tourism, because of course tourism is more or less everything. It's, uh, it's transport, it's accommodation, and then, of course, it's, it's hotels and saying who is staying here. So let's say uh, normal classification is uh, you have uh, business visitors, you have a uh, person visiting friends and relatives. Are these real tourists? You are people going for health, medical tourism. Are these real tourists? What we generally talk about when we talk about tourists and tourism are uh, pleasure tourists, recreational tourists, leisure tourists, and uh, of course this again can be broken down in a number of main categories. We have the typical leisure tourism, 
sun, sand, and sea, and uh, nature tourism, uh, along with so-called ecotourism or ecological tourism. That's a term invented by the World Bank. Of course, tourists can never be ecotourists or ecological tourists. I mean, they're always in fact. having an impact on the environment and uh, let's say and again we have the uh, so-called sustainable tourism which again is a misnomer in some ways but uh, let's say the uh, really ecological minded or sustainability minded should not be a tourist they should stay at home and see that their garden is full of weeds, not uh, agricultural products. I mean, the world has been going the wrong way for the last 9,000 years since agriculture was invented, but still uh, you, you hear a lot about organic agriculture, ecological agriculture. But uh, tourism is important. I, I just got this off the uh, the uh, International New York Times today, and Modi, of course, is probably winning the, the, the now ongoing election in India, and the party highlighted the tourism sector, a major player in job creation, an important generator of boring extension. The party said it would create 50 tourist circles that revol revolved around broad scenes like archaeology, culture, spirituality, the Himalayas, and the coast. So it, it, tourism plays a major role in uh, the world uh, economy, and uh, a number of, of countries are, many smaller countries are totally dependent on tourism. But I put this sign up to sort of show that tourism is no longer a uh, a typical Western-only activity. Actually, the uh, greatest uh, uh, producer of tourists, that is domestic and international, are the Chinese, and the Chinese are the biggest spenders in overseas tourism. So let's say, for you, those of you who can read uh, Chinese, uh, Korean, or Japanese, uh, you can read the text. Anyway, it's not very helpful for Western tourists when you see a sign like this. But of course, it's nice to know that uh, people reading uh, other languages are informed. Uh, I've just come back from Somaliland, and of course, in Somaliland, you don't have much in the way of tourism. I'm just showing a picture from the uh, from the Zouk or the Bazaar in Hargeisa in the capital. But even when you get it out to the coast, you have one uh, small hotel in Somaliland in Barbera, and here you find Somali pleasure tourists. I have a photograph of four here. And of course, they are not local. These were Canadians coming back to visit the old country, and then uh, they will have a beach holiday like uh, other Western tourists. Uh, in other countries, like <coughs> uh, Bangladesh, where I have to look at tourism, let's say the perception of the good life of a holiday, of a vacation, of pleasure, is not linked to nature conservation. I uh, took a number of photos of the paintings on the uh, backs of trucks. And here is actually a picture of the uh, Bangladeshi perception of the good life, the good holiday. I mean, everything ordered and so forth. When you see uh, Bangladesh, you can see the reason why uh, people long for order. They should be. Uh, fenced, uh, there should be nice houses and open lawns. And so, let's say, uh, perceptions of uh, what should be a, a 
at issue of the day will differ. Now, if we take China, we have an enormous uh, tourism traffic, and especially internal traffic in uh, China, domestic tourism. Here we have a group of young people in uh, Chongqing. In Chongqing, you almost see no Western tourists. The Western tourists will pass Chongqing for a night, then go on and cruise on the Yangtze River, then on to uh, uh, Chengdu and Xi'an for other things uh, stops on their way. But here uh, we are in the old town of Chongqing. And uh, then when we look at China, this is the provincial museum of, uh, in, in Xi'an. Not where you have the terracotta warriors, but actually a, uh, a national museum. And this is taken on a Sunday <coughs> morning uh, before the uh, ticket counter is open. And actually, uh, on a Sunday morning, you have a huge line of hundreds of people wanting to get into the museum. So you can't say that uh, Chinese are several people to that extent they are incredibly interested in their own culture, they travel within their own country, and uh, an hour later the museum will be completely full of people. You don't see many Westerners here. Westerners will go to see the terracotta statues, where it's uh, very crowded with Westerners. Here, actually, you can see terracotta statues uh, very close up. <coughs> and of course, another uh, generator of tourism in Asia is Japan. Uh, you will notice Japanese very often have this typical with the flag and group tourism. You have a guide and you follow the flag. This is from the taking at the uh, at the castle in Nagoya. And then we have India. Uh, India is, uh, well, religious tourism is very prominent. Uh, at the Kong Mela, uh, there will be more than a tourist visit, uh, a million tourist visitors coming in. Uh, but in India, you often have family tourism. You travel with grandparents, parents, uh, sons-in-law, daughters-in-law, and, and uh, and uh, grandchildren as big groups. Here the photo is from Sikkim. And uh, again, now we get into close to ethnic tourism and colonialism. Uh, let's say all these tourists in Sikkim are Bengalis. Uh, they come for one or two days. They spend very little money. They fill uh, seven, eight, twelve people into a hotel room, and then they explore the uh, interesting uh, tribal, so-called diversity of uh, of the team. And here you have uh, you can go to one of the photo shops, and you can dress yourself up as a uh, Sikhamese, whatever, I mean, uh, if it's, uh, <coughs> if it's uh, Debsha or, or, uh, or Limbo or, or Bhutia, but uh, anyway, it's this. And uh, then you have uh, ethnic tourism again, you get the fun to ride on the yacht, and then you can take your photos back home. Now, tourism in Europe, of course, started with uh, uh, high class, upper class travel, uh, mainly to cultural destinations like Greece, and uh, this is from, from Venice, from the start of the last century. And, uh, of course, group travel started in the 
middle of the 1800s with uh, travel first within England and then overseas travel to nearby countries and then with uh, the first far excursion to uh, Egypt. And uh, cultural tourism, of course, is a major component of tourism today. This is a group of <coughs> Australian tourists in, uh, in May in St. Petersburg. And uh, of course, this is uh, uh, traveling for cultural reasons. Now, the thing is that people uh, often travel for, let's say, beach pleasure reasons. You go to the beach, but uh, it's important in tourism that uh, you have a story to tell when you come back. So uh, you have what you call bragging rights. You have done something that others haven't done. And for that reason, if you see uh, the program for travelers today, uh, especially in the West, but also catching on in China, <coughs> Japan, etc., uh, you'll see that you have a holiday on the beach and onwards from that uh, you combine it with a bit of culture and you combine it with a bit of nature. And these things are just uh, adds on. They are not really important when you are there, but they are very important when you come back because nobody wants to listen to somebody say, I, I went on a holiday and people say, what did you do? And people say, well, I uh, was on the beach the whole time. And people say, ah, how boring. I mean, everybody <laughs> been to the beach. But of course, if they say, well, we went to this destination by the sea, and then we went and saw the Angkor Wat, or uh, uh, fascinating temples, and we actually also went into the forest where we met a tiger. And I have a <coughs> photo of the tiger. And, uh, this is from Vietnam, from my son. And of course, tourism is theater. Uh, we all know, no, I mean, not everybody knows this, but let's say when you plan tourism, you plan it as theater. Uh, let's say if this is uh, uh, local dancing, charm dancing, of course, this is very ethically interesting. And uh, there are so many people around that you need a telelens to get a good photo of you in there. And then again, when you plan uh, tourism, uh, let's say I've worked a lot with so-called ecotourism in national parks, in the uh, Vietnamese rainforest. And the first thing you say is, firstly, we have to sort people in different groups, the noisy people, the young noisy people, one group, we put them outside the actual forest. Then we have the uh, general travelers. Uh, we let them into the forest, but not too deep in, in the forest. But you have a warden who will take them around in a uh, circular winding route. And as soon as you're in the rainforest, of course, these people will be lost. And the rainforest looks more or less the same uh, everywhere to people with out. And then you have the special interest tourists like the uh, bird watchers, like the ornithologists, and they are allowed to pay to pay heavily for uh, going deeper into the forest, sitting in the hive, being shown a shown a fruiting uh, fig tree or something where the birds will congregate. So the important, the other important thing is that such uh, group travel should include what you call a reasonable amount of hardship. This means when people are taken into the rainforest, they have to get their pants or skirts dirty because when they get back to the hotel, if they uh, come back in the same clothes, nobody will listen to them. But you have to say, look, I mean, we have, we have been deep in the forest. It was muddy and uh, the water was dripping down and uh, uh, there was a bit of heroism. I, I asked 
in, in Samoa one time, naively, uh, the cruise ships will come to Samoa and then they will take passengers in the dinghies. And they were, one of the cruise ships were taking the passengers in where the breakers came over the reefs. So they got a rather rough ride and I said, why do you take them this way? Why don't you take them straight into the harbor? And they said, well, then they will have no experience. Mm -hmm. They will have nothing to tell when they get back. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we went to Samoa and we sat in this little boat and it almost overturned when we were crossing the breakers on the reef. Now we have a story to tell when we get back home. And of course now it's photographed, this is from uh, Sikkim near the Kapanjunga in the background from a, uh, one of the temples. And of course people don't go inside, but again you have your teledentals out and you photograph. Now the majority of high spending tourists from the West are people uh, about 60 years old. Uh, of course, uh, what people tend to forget when we talk about the hardship of the elderly is that actually 80% of the fortune of the world is owned by people over 60 years. So let's say these people are, not all of them, but many of them are millionaires, they have paid their houses, they have paid for their car, they uh, have a nice pension, and now they have the option to travel. And of course one place that has made uh, a scoop in elderly tourism is Bhutan. And here again, I mean Bhutan of course has absolutely wonderful architecture, I usually say there two countries in the world where you can't take uh, poor pictures of architecture. One is Bhutan and the other is Yemen. For some odd reason, very few tourists go to Yemen these days. But, uh, but uh, Bhutan, this is uh, a street in Bhutan where you have the traditional buildings. People are forced to wear traditional clothes in all government administration and so uh, you have elderly people paying 200 250 dollars a day for a full packet tour so they will land in paro in mountain dress with heavy boots ready for the mountains be picked up by a driver in natural in, in national costume who speaks excellent english and then they drive on it out along the roads and uh, so they can be photographed with a mountain or architectural uh, view, uh, just getting out of the car. But again, let's say, going back, you can say, look, uh, grandma went to the Himalayas. Uh, you see, I was out in the mountains. And so you, you fly on these planes with all these elderly people dressed for a heavy mountain experience, almost looking like mountain climbers. And of course, they are, there is an enormous satisfaction level because, uh, let's say, you can do this without any hardship. And this means also, actually, it's used in, in, in advertising that Bhutan is basically free of backpackers. Actually, all the roadsides in, in, uh, in Bhutan, uh, the main plant growing there is, uh, is cannabis. So, but, well, it's, it's very nice when, uh, when they burn garden refuse, it's, uh, it's mainly cannabis and you get this lovely smell walking down the street. But of course, without the backpackers, these old uh, people, many old ladies in their mountain boots, don't sit down and smoke the grass without the grass. <laughs> Now, uh, of course, one of the uh, main things with tourism is cruise tourism. And of course, cruise tourism is uh, complete theater. I mean, you have the floor, you have these cruise ships in the Caribbean, some of them carrying 4,000 passengers, uh, a uh, crew of six, 7,000. So you have enormous amounts of visitors 
pouring in from such a cruise These uh, pictures are from Aruba, and uh, this is a main destination for uh, middle class Americans, a uh, large number from New Jersey, which is a typical middle class state. And, um, so, and with Aruba, we have one country that is absolutely and completely dependent on tourism. We have two countries in the world. One is Aruba, the other one is on, on pleasure tourism. One is Aruba, the other one is the, uh, is the more divided. And then, of course, we have countries that are dependent on pleasure and interest tourism. And cruise ship uh, travel is the, the new fad. Cruise ships are going everywhere. I took this picture of one of the large cruise ships in Ushuaia, in Tierra del Fuego. And uh, this, of course, is going on to uh, Antarctica, uh, possibly to the Falkland Islands, to New Georgia, and Antarctica. And you have people going off the ship. And again, we have uh, here from uh, Vietnam, from Hanoi Bay, uh, where uh, everything is provided. You don't really uh, need to uh, meet the local people, which in many ways is a good thing. It's just a question of where your, where your money goes. Of course, we have uh, tourism in other parts of the taken from Armenia, uh, uh, Georgian, uh, local Armenian, and Russian tourists, and uh, of course photographing the, uh, the uh, Mount Ararat, which the Turks took away from the holy mountain of Armenia, which the Turks took away from Armenia during the, uh, the Armenian genocide. When, uh, uh, two million Armenians were killed. Now we go into a bit of ethnic tourism again. We are up almost 5,000 kilometers in the Himalayas in Sikkim, again with Bengali tourists. And uh, as you see, uh, it's not uh, specifically ecotourism. It's uh, a lot of garbage will end up on the ground. You have the local Tibetans selling coffee and drinks, and then you have the Bengalis dressed for the venture. Here we have uh, from the Andaman Islands. The Andaman Islands, actually 88% uh, of forest is protected forest. I talked with the Forest Service, and they are, of course, constantly fighting <coughs> the tourism department as they were fighting the tourism department in Sikkim which only has 82% protected forest and highland uh, tourism laws. And here is, uh, there was a peace excursion by students from the medical college, and uh, you see the environment and awareness is not very highly developed. Uh, here is an example on, of Indian peace tourism, which, uh, means that you sit and look at the water because most Indians, Indian Indians cannot swim, but you can sit and look at the water and then you can walk out in the, uh, the water. Of course, this is real beach tourism, low-key beach tourism. Uh, the uh, photo is from Grand Comor in the Comora Islands. And here we have uh, the larger beach tourism in Aruba with this uh, constant influx of uh, middle South America. Here we get to the Maldiv Islands. Maldiv Islands have developed a fantastic uh, marketing apparatus and uh, selling themselves as uh, sustainable, uh, ecological, and so forth at the same time uh, destroying their reefs and building uh, uh, hotels out in the water on small piers, at the same time marketing themselves that they are going to manage 
in seven years due to a sea rise that no one has seen so far. At least the airport people and the investors in tourism uh, has not noticed this. Now, the majority of tourists in the Maldives have uh, become Chinese. Uh, more than 40% of visitors to the Maldives are Chinese now. And uh, here we have a young couple taking photographs on the beach. And here is a, um, a, a Turkish advertisement for the Maldives Islands. And uh, if you don't know it, this is a tourist island. Uh, you can see how ecological it is, how environmentally sound it is, and so you have these little piers uh, sticking <coughs> out uh, everywhere. And uh, now if you go to inhabited islands in the Maldives, uh, all tourist islands are built on uninhabited islands, you'll find that the beaches look like this. I've been able to take these pictures because I spent a lot of time in the Maldives. And then again, when we look close to the capital, we have the uh, Ilafuchi, the garbage island, where everybody, every, uh, all the chemicals, uh, uh, oil is spilling out on the coral reefs. Uh, there's a huge environmental destruction going on, and the Maldives Islands are the only is the only country in the area that does not have any uh, nature protected area as yet. Actually, I wrote the uh, first nature protection plan back in 1983, and uh, when delivered to the president, he said, "Well." You see, we don't need this. God will provide. So let's say the Maldives are not being flooded by a sea rise. Nothing has happened so far, but they are certainly destroying the environment. At the same time, they are selling themselves as environmentally sound and paradise island. This, of course, convinces this is the, uh, the Danish uh, Union against the. Uh, European community. And uh, they have, uh, for the climate conference in Copenhagen, they made this poster that uh, the uh, climate uh, plan for uh, the European Union is too small and too poor, and the mortgages will vanish. Uh, actually, the mortgages invented the sea rise when they uh, uh, got to the level uh, of uh, per capita income, where they were not uh, uh, able to get uh, the usual aid, so let's say. But I, I called the uh, Union against the EU, and I said, why do you uh, picture a, uh, a uh, five-star tourist hotel on your poster? And they said, well, uh, sorry, uh, we didn't know. We thought this was the normal habitation of the Maldives Islanders. <laughs> so, and while tourism is growing, so let's say, when I look at what comes out of the, uh, of the Center for Responsible Travel, they say tourism is preventing conflict and promoting peace. This is very doubtful. I mean, the destruction of the Maldives is done purely by Maldivians. And while uh, you have uh, uh, a lot of fun on the tourist islands, if you care uh, about being in jail on a small, small island with palm trees <coughs> and food, but at the same time, you have uh, uh, fundamental Islam taking over the uh, inhabited islands, the capital of the Maldives. Uh, recently, a, uh, a young couple was uh, given a uh, year in jail for kissing each other on the street. So let's say it, it doesn't necessarily. And then uh, tourism, of course, attracts uh, all uh, 
diplomats and, and uh, let's say when I first came to the Maldives in, in 1974 and 1976 we were uh, three uh, Westerners in the Maldives and there was no representation and now of course you have an American center, you have a Chinese center, you have a British council and you have an Alliance Francais and everybody is so, and let's say, when we look again, let's say this is from Dubai. Dubai is one of the, uh, again, uh, enormously marketed tourist destinations. And uh, so one would think that uh, this would change the attitude of the population of Dubai being exposed to Western wars. Uh, of course, this is not a in fact, uh, we also hear uh, people in the West saying that tourism is destructive by not uh, uh, abiding by local traditions. Now, of course, this is a moral question. Is it a good local tradition that women are veiled and men can walk around in short pants? And uh, is it a good tradition? Okay, uh, here we have a, uh, a sign in the Burj Khalifa. Uh, and this is even better. <laughs> you can see what unruly behavior it is. If you behave. And, and uh, I, I followed this couple a little bit, and here suddenly they also engage in obvious unruly. Yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, this is from Doha in Qatar. Of course, this is the playground for the money people. Where a hotel room will cost you 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 dollars a night. And you come in a uh, small clothes. And now, if we look at the uh, at, uh, Qatar, uh, the United Emirates, uh, they are, all, all services are carried out by uh, indentured workers. Uh, there's an enormous amount of human trafficking going on, and uh, this is taken from uh, Doha in Qatar, where uh, Bangladeshi workers live uh, six, seven people on, in, uh, on three and a half square meters. Uh, where uh, 20 people would have access to one toilet and uh, abuses are enormous. This is the Maldive Islands. The, Maldiv the Maldivians have stopped working again. So let's say if we talk about abuse in tourism, this is carried out by uh, Asian nations, uh, especially by uh, Arab nations and nations <coughs> in two Arab countries. Whereas this is from this is from Sikkim, uh, we uh, three of the uh, girls uh, in housekeeping, uh, one Bhutia in the middle, of course Bhutia lived to Tibetan, a uh, uh, Nepalese to the uh, to the left, and a uh, uh, to the right. But of course again, uh, open rock Sikkim is based on imported Nepalese workers that live quite differently from the uh, uh, tourists. And uh, here, I mean, there's often a discussion about uh, child work. Uh, these are from uh, Indonesia, from uh, Georgia Carta, and a lot of the uh, souvenir production is done by families, same as you see in Madagascar. So they say it's not always exploitation of children. These children will go to school and be part of the family business. But then we have the overt racism, and this is uh, this is a souvenir from uh, the Andaman Islands, shown at the government shop in the Andaman Islands. 
and this is supposedly the uh, the Jaravan. Now, in reality, they look a bit different, and um, recently there has been so much noise on the internet uh, that uh, they decided to change the governor of the Andaman Islands and uh, give protection to the native indigenous people. So now you can only travel through the forest two times a day in convoy. And uh, actually now the Jarva will come out and watch the convoys going through. But the ethnic tourism is uh, a gross element in other parts of the world. This of course is from Ethiopia, from the uh, Omo River, and of course in China you have enormous amounts of ethnic tourism where people come to visit colorful ethnic minorities. This of course is uh, what this is Amara, what the uh, what the actual people of the area look like. These are Amaras, <coughs> so it's not it's not uh, and then of course you have these uh, special tours when somebody has been in television, uh, you will see suddenly a television personality that will show up and say, uh, the important thing with this trip is meeting the local people, uh, tribal people, uh, fishermen, and villagers. And of course, uh, these are, to a high degree, people who have no idea about uh, Okay, I'll try to go. This is high cost tourism. Again, for elderly people, this is Lindblad expeditions, the most expensive expeditions in the world. And of course, they just landed on the island where I live, on Bornholm. And uh, actually, so uh, they find very exciting things. And this is what we close to actually get to it for tourism if they weren't spending so much uh, fuel on the ship that a headshot can be exciting. Of course, you have extreme tourism, non-destructive, let's say, going to the inland ice, destructive, if you... And here, in the National Park of Aruba, you don't really care about the park, you just uh, uh, travel along, uh, macro-tourism. Here we have the uh, keeping buildings intact in Denmark on Christmas Eve in the neighborhood. And here we have uh, untouched islands in Vietnam where the beaches have now been sold off. So the uh, local populations will not be allowed on the beaches anymore. Here we have from the old Danish port in fortress in Trangabar on the Coromandel coast in India. And uh, this has also, always been, also been destroyed by the Danish company Bestseller, which is one of the major uh, fashion clothes producers. And this is what it all will look after they went there. Uh, uh, here we have uh, touristic improvements in Sikkim. This is the valley that where expeditions to climb on Everest were usually coming through. And of course, the government of Sikkim has found that this was an excellent place to build a cafeteria in the form of a chip. <laughs> and then we have uh, souvenirs, sort of destroying local culture. Of course, all these, this is from the Maldiv Islands. Uh, Maldiv Islands don't produce African masks, uh, but you can buy these masks all over the world. And uh, actually, they are produced in Indonesia. <laughs> also, when you buy African masks along the road in South Africa, 
or in Swaziland, they're also Indonesian products. Indonesia is exporting African nuts to Africa. Of course, you know, African nuts are only originally produced in West Africa and then along the Makonda on the uh, Kuruna River between. So, and of course, we have the destruction of the first and of rare marine animals, destruction of coral, and uh, then we have local things. The funny thing is in Aruba, uh, the carnival is something local. It's not for tourists. Tourists are not interested. They have, they have 12 casinos. They have the beaches, they have the hotels, and of course, uh, tourism you can create from nothing. <laughs> has no artistic value at all. Uh, it's very small. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice location, it's by the sea. But I actually timed during the summer, and uh, a photograph was taken of the little mermaid every 10 seconds. So you have this enormous stream of, uh, and, and probably she is one of the most photographed women in the, uh, in the world. Here we have a different type of tourism. This is from the no man's land between uh, South and North Korea. We have the children coming up from their mothers looking into North Korea. Actually, the no man's land between South Korea and North Korea is one of the most efficient wildlife reserves in the world because it is absolutely untouched. There is everything that has been preserved. Most uh, wildlife has been, of course, totally destroyed in North Korea and destroyed to a high degree in South Korea. Here you have the only uh, nature reserve that is absolutely free from uh, people, including people tourists. And then, of course, you have these art attractions. This is the Stalin Museum in Glory, in Georgia, and uh, which is, uh, it was closed for a short time and then was reopened again because it's actually extremely important to keep it there because suddenly you can look back in the past in, in the hideous past of Stalinism and of course uh, what many of you may know Stalin was not a Russian he was a Georgian actually he was uh, his father was South Ossetian and his mother was Georgian and uh, his uh, enforcer uh, Beria <coughs> was uh, also Georgian and uh, who had grown up in Abkhazia. This was built by Beria, but most people don't know is that Beria actually was trained as an architect originally. Uh, Sikkim, 
which is actually working quite well. We have the small family hotels. And what I was saying, a more destructive than the tourists from what I've seen in my time are the different NGOs. Whenever there's a catastrophe, uh, I don't know if you read coal, uh, the crisis caravan, but whenever there is a catastrophe or something, you have these people running out, destroying. This is from Tankerbar after the tsunami, and uh, uh, fishermen were getting, who had lost their cattle run, were getting two or three boats that were then sold to the west coast. And I said, what's the change after the tsunami? I said, well, in the old days we would walk to the uh, liquor shops in Karikal, which is 11 kilometers away, to uh, buy liquor to take back to Trakabar. Now we take a taxi. And here we have the Hope Foundation that built the English medium school, which destroyed all the small local schools. They started for free, now they are taking money for it. They were stealing all initiatives. Here we have all of these things like USAID. I mean, Bangladesh was full of USAID. This is coming up. Uh, they built it sort of destroying the <coughs> view of the port, an enormous water tank. And they say, look how good we are. Only problem is there is no water in the tank. And then again, we have the Danish Trankabar Society uh, supplying uh, adequate garbage cans for the town, but of course not providing a uh, garbage disposal service. And again, uh, NGOs, this of course is a German initiative, this is near to the coast, so it's very good to have, I mean when the next tsunami comes, of course 20 meters from the coast, we have an ambulance. <laughs> 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 We just put them in the slot, and then we can take them off one by one in the ambulance. Don't let the bandits fall asleep. I've got one good thing in my life. I saved the island of Adrenaline in the Solomon Islands from logging. It was going to be logged by a combined Australian logging company from Queensland and uh, a Malaysian company. And it has the greatest, the largest lake in the in the island Pacific. Uh, it has an intensity uh, of 40 percent. This is a lake on an island in the Pacific. Uh, they were going to clear out the island, and the island is calciferous, it's uh, lime, and this would have meant that everything would have washed down in the lake and destroyed the lake. Uh, we convinced, or I convinced the government of uh, the Solomon Islands that by leaving the forest on the route, they would have increased value on the island, and with a small tourist facility with 20 rooms and an occupancy rate of 60%, they could get the same money back they would get from logging the island in 12 years. And that meant they handled the contract. So uh, I, I don't know if this was helpful in any way. Uh, it's, it's, I could have uh, uh, put a, a large amount of numbers on the blackboard, but let's say tourism is a very difficult thing to talk about because everybody knows everything about tourism. I realize that traveling out. Everybody has been a tourist. I see these uh, PhD theses that pass my way all the time uh, with uh, an incredible amount of nonsense about tourism and uh, people are being fired during the off season. Nobody wants to get rid of people who are fully trained in tourism. Uh, everybody wants to keep them in. And uh, I saw one recently about the bumpsters in, in, uh, in uh, Gambia uh, saying when they provide very well for the families, I mean this is to a high degree uh, elderly female sex tourism to Gambia 
or it can be a highly specialized to a degree. And uh, the question is how many uh, people are driven away? This is the same thing I usually say with water scooters or fast craft. Uh, people say, well, this is making money. And I say, you have to look how many uh, families they drive away from the beach. And then you have to calculate. Because, I mean, maybe you make so and so much, but you, and, and the same by uh, destroying the environment, how much uh, is, it, is it really worth? Oh, yes. So, um, I suppose it's, it's, it's mainly been uh, confusing when I tried to sort of cover the, the whole spectrum very fast. And uh, I would like to answer specific or general questions. My hearing is almost gone after flying for the last two months, but I think uh, Lars can help me with uh, uh, saying what people are saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I, I don't understand most languages, uh, well, Western languages, not most of them, but uh, my hearing is not very good. It doesn't benefit 
the uh, local population as such, it benefits the uh, local elites and the local corruption. Uh, 
uh, let's say if you build a facility at a pristine location where uh, there is easy access, uh, you have a chance of having your money back within five years actually. And that means when you have your money back, the next five years of your profit. So uh, a lot of tourism is sort of uh, uh, hit, grab and run. And then of course, I mean, you have the ultra profit. The, the, uh, the fifth most uh, profitable tourist destination, which people don't think about, is Macau actually. <coughs> in Macau, I mean, uh, people come mainly from China to burn <coughs> illegal money. And of course, I mean, if you spend uh, $50 million in a casino or blackjack, you will have winnings of uh, maybe $10 million, which are winnings, of course which is suddenly white money you take back. So let's say uh, a lot of, well, casinos of course, but also a lot of the hotel industry is built for whitewashing money. And of course these people don't care. So let's say, uh, unless you have an overall country strategy for uh, tourism planning, uh, it becomes a free for all, and you get the uh, fly by night operators. The Maldives had a, uh, a full tourism master plan, and, and uh, I warned them back in the 80s. I said, if you keep building uh, uh, resorts around the capital, you will have a demographic catastrophe. At that time, the uh, there were 30,000 inhabitants in the capital Mala. Now there are about 120,000. It's the densest inhabited uh, capital island in the world. And uh, 10 years later, I met the Minister of Tourism and he said, Yes, it was very interesting what you wrote about <coughs> the demographic catastrophe. Uh, you were perfectly right, and uh, of course we didn't do anything. And of course uh, they're, they're swimming in money in the Maldives now, but uh, only a small group of, of uh, people, and uh, let's say uh, prices have risen and, and, uh, and uh, uh, low income families uh, live 10, 15 to a room while the money is flowing in constantly from the, uh, from the uh, tourism resort. But I mean that, that uh, I suppose that goes for all industry that if not controlled and uh, not uh, uh, there is no uh, legislation that is enforced, uh, you will have a, a free fall, like the energy sector in, in China, like the chemical sector in China, like, uh, let's say, industry in, in Russia and the, uh, the Marxist countries uh, during the, uh, the heroic period of, of communism. Uh, that uh, nobody cared what what really happened because either it was prestige or it was it was money. So to say in, in that way, I suppose that uh, Europe is still ahead of the rest of the world. Um, what is your view on volunteer tourism? Volunteer tourism, what is your view? Volunteer tourism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with volunteer tourism, you, you mean working for a uh, 
uh, organization with a uh, <coughs> with a po positive humanitarian goal, right? Yeah. Uh, that very much depends on who you who you work for. Uh, I would certainly uh, uh, recommend to to read this Dutch uh, journalist Paul's book about uh, uh, NGOs called the the Crisis Caravan, the Crisis Caravan, and uh, uh, which sort of exposes uh, especially the Red Cross but also the Save the Children's Foundation and so forth. Of course, I mean, uh, one of the, well, she gives a number of stories, I mean, that, that, uh, about uh, uh, Rwanda. I mean, you have these uh, NDO people traveling all over the world and, and sort of uh, uh, being paid for doing good. And then you have a lower layer of Volunteers. If you look at the head of the uh, Save the Children Foundation, paid more than a million dollars a year to sit on top of something, and if you look at and and uh, let's say in in Sierra Leone during the Civil War, uh, the Red Cross was well, let's say was financing the continuation of the war because they were paying these militant groups to be able to get in. Uh, one thing was that they said we don't need to come in uh, in areas where people don't get their hands and ears and noses cut off. So we want to help the people who are really suffering. So of course the uh, small militias realized this, so they started cutting hands and ears and noses off and very soon the Red Cross would be there, spending money to be able to get in. I mean, it's like the, uh, it's like the British government uh, sending orthopedic surgeons to Saudi Arabia to assist people uh, in a country where they cut their hands or teeth. But as I, I would say it, it's, it should be watched very closely. I've, I've been in contact with three NGOs that I found impressive. I mean, one is uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, of course, because these people will work for almost free, because they know they're going back to a good job afterwards. So they can pull a year or two out of the calendar, and they don't need to. But the thing, most uh, NGOs are about stealing money from the pockets of uh, uh, believing people at home. And the other one is uh, uh, SOS, Children's Villages, where I've, I haven't been able to find anything negative uh, about them. And, uh, and the, the third one, which I actually work for uh, is uh, Grammar Bank uh, RAC in Bangladesh, which was an incredible organization. Of course, the government has tried to destroy it because I mean, it, it became almost a state in the state. But I'm not saying, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of, of small NGOs that, that function absolutely perfectly. It's just that, that I don't know them. And then it's, it's very difficult to say when you go one place or another, uh, which one, because I, I, uh, uh, I have uh, hated the American Peace Corps, and then I got to the Central African Republic, and suddenly I found that the American Peace Corps was functioning. And uh, I was asked by the leader, I was working for the Danish government at the time, uh, which uh, local NGO would you suggest we collaborate with? And I said, well, the American people. And they said, well, that's the American State Department. And I said, I don't care. I don't care who they are. I only look at what is, is being done. And I 
I don't care if CIA is in the Central African Republic. <laughs> Yeah. I, I was wondering if, uh, from your experience, how likely is that a destination that has been traditionally exploited uh, can revert that uh, relationship with the tourism? And uh, yeah, if you know any good examples of that. Can you revert uh, the negative development uh, resorts that have been uh, destroyed? Huh? Resorts, uh, tourist destinations that have been uh, partially destroyed. Can you revert in the German? Go back. Uh, <coughs> let's say it, it's difficult to say. Let's say beaches are uh, the least sensitive areas in in the world. I mean beaches, as you know. I mean uh, you you uh, <coughs> die on the beach. You, uh, have a huge amount of beach tourist museums, hotels, and with the next winter storm or the next uh, tsunami or something, everything is gone. So a beach will re-establish itself. Of course, uh, with forests, it's not tourism that loves the forest. Uh, tourism actually wants the forest to stand. You can't recreate a forest within short term. Uh, the places where tourism is very dangerous, of course, are the Arctic, which Sweden will know. I mean, in, in, uh, I, I worked uh, with uh, a tourism master plan in Mongolia, and one heavy deep track will last for 20 years. So here you have to plan your infrastructure and, and, uh, <coughs> and have uh, vehicles on the road. Uh, uh, coral reefs, uh, if you destroy them totally, like the military did in the Philippines, uh, it takes a long time to regrow. Of course, the military in the Philippines were fishing with uh, dynamite and grenades. And this means that when you sail out, you will see enormous, enormous reef areas that are destroyed. And it's a minor reef destruction. The, the reef, of course, will, uh, will grow back. On, on this, we have uh, ocean acidity with global warming. Uh, let's say, uh, what should I say? Uh, most natural environment will revert in, in time. But some takes a, a long time. <laughs> Sorry, it's very general. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so uh, we won't be able to have more questions. Uh, thank you, Nils, for coming. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, please give us a warm applause.